Uh, let me just thank you once again for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, have a chat with us and tell us more about uh, you and your work. Um, on which note, can you just start by introducing yourself for us a little bit? Yeah, so I'm Lehua Ledbetter. Um, I'm an associate professor of writing and rhetoric at the University of Rhode Island in Kingston, Rhode Island. Um, and I've been in this position for, this is my seventh year. Um, I graduated with my PhD in rhetoric and writing from Michigan State University. And um, I do a lot of work in cultural rhetorics, um, but also professional writing and technical communication um, and um, digital writing, um, workplace writing genres, and all of the intersections of those things. I'm about to hear cultural rhetorics uh, next week with uh, Les Copos. It'll be pretty fun as well. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, um, great. Yeah. So we were talking um just before about the money side of beauty YouTubers. You said you get this question a lot, and I think a lot of us think about it quite a lot. Um so I know that uh that money um money really matters. Can you tell us a little bit about um what you know about how YouTubers navigate presenting their own stories with the need to uh, monetize their content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you know, I think I think I'm I'm often asked this as an either or question. So, are they doing it for money, or are they doing it for you know community community building, um, you know, identity and story uh, storytelling? Um, but the thing is, um, it's actually a really complicated issue, and those things are all tied up together, and you can't really separate them. Um, you know, at some of the parts of the questions you sent me were really interesting. Um, as we talk a little bit about uh, monetization and like market saturation. So I do want to point out that some of these things might have changed since, you know, when I actually did the study, which was like 2012 to 2013. Um, and and back, back then, it wasn't quite as saturated as it is now. So now it's very saturated. So, so some of the things YouTubers might say now might be very different. Um, the people that I spoke to at the time, um, you know, they talked about needing to, you know, obviously needing to make a living and, um, you know, being drawn to YouTube for that reason. And then kind of realizing along the way that, um, you know, in doing so, they were finding a sense of belonging and community in this, in this particular group that they became part of. Um, so it, it may have been, you know, it may have been motivated, the motivation might have been finding some kind of supplementary income, um, you know, and especially as, um, you know, the, one of my study participants, um, you know, was working full time, um, but was also on her own. Uh, she was a child, she's a child of immigrants and, you know, as being first generation was someone who really needed to finance her own education. Um, and didn't really have the luxury of, of being able to, you know, um, pay for school, uh, you know, so, so for her, the YouTubing was actually an important means of, of survival in that sense. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we still, we still need money <laughs> to survive and, you know, until, um, and especially here in the United States. So, um, you know, I think, I think you can't really separate those things. And I, I think um, one of the things that I found was that, um, you know, you can do both. You can, you can try to monetize and you can try to make money off of your platform and you can still be using it in ways that are tactical or in ways that um, resist uh, oppressive discourses or dominant, or dominant discourses. Um, and it's okay, that's okay to do both, especially for marginalized communities and people who, who, you know, as I said, often don't have the privilege or the luxury of, you know, being able to just focus on, um, you know, resistance or, you know, um, being able to just focus on, um, you know, dismantling oppressive discourses. The rea you know, I'm, I won't get started with, um, I won't get started with how the, the um, American social system fails to meet the needs of the people <laughs> in a way that supports them and allows them to pursue what they actually want to do with their lives. A lot of people can't do that. So, yeah. um, and I experienced my, that myself with YouTube. 
Um, for me, I was in grad school when I started making the beauty tutorials myself and um, I don't do it anymore, but at the time um, it was enough to have a little bit of pocket change. And as most people know, you don't make money in grad school at all. So, yeah. yeah. So I guess the, the short answer to that is it's complicated. And most of the time people are doing both, um, particularly people who are in a more uh, vulnerable position. Yeah, my um my grad school stipend was fourteen hundred a month in Austin, nine months a year, and not allowed to work off campus to supplement it. And so I had like an eBay thrift store flipping thing yeah. going, which was yeah pretty good, but so yeah. much work. <laughs> work, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times you may not have the time to actually pursue a secondary like brick and mortar job. So right. yeah. You know, if you- do it at home then you know that's that's maybe more realistic for someone who's a grad student or someone who's also working full-time at mm-hmm. another job yeah yeah or well, who doesn't have access to it for, you know yeah. if you're a, an immigrant in, and, and like in a place where you don't speak mm-hmm. um, speak the language well right? being able to do that kind of online work in a space where your linguistic skills are valued can be really yes. effective absolutely yeah 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 um, we had we had these threads of uh, surviving culture and resisting um, mm-hmm. dominant narratives uh, yeah. through that answer, um, and I know that in your other work relating to this study, you talked about uh, this term survivance, that combination of survival and resistance. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about how money facilitates that for marginalised creators? Yeah, well, so the term survivance um, that that is a term that I um, borrow from Malia Powell um, in her article, um, uh, Rhetorics of Survivance, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, you know, her article really looks at um, how people take a more tactical approach, um, you know, referring to um, uh, like the the small little things that people can do for resisting or making change in their day-to-day lives rather, rather than having like big you know, systemic, um, systemic change making. So, um, okay, wait, so you, you might have to ask me that question again. So you're saying, what does that look like? <laughs> so, yeah. sure. um, so I formulated when I wrote it down, which is maybe the better way to give it to you rather than redo it on the fly at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, what I wrote was, um, how does money contribute to marginalized YouTubers ability to survive and resist dominant cultures? So what That's does- right. What's the relationship between money and survivance? Yeah. So, I mean, besides the opposite, I mean, opposite, besides the obvious one, which is that we, we need to pay for our means of survive for living. Um, I think that um, one of the other, one of the other things is that uh, resistance can involve making space for others and making space for yourself. And that is hard to do. In fact, any form of resistance is really hard to do when all you're focusing on is, you know, how to meet your basic needs like food or shelter. Um, I, again, I experienced some of this myself at certain times in my life um, where I felt, I felt that focusing so much on those very basic needs um, kept me from, kept me from doing some of the things that I really wanted to do. Um, (laughs) um, so if you have a means of financing your life and meeting those needs, I think, then you can create, you can create a little bit of space for yourself. Um, you can create a platform for yourself and you can start thinking about how to create a platform for others who may not have it. Um, and you know, I think this applies to many different aspects, many different career paths, many different aspects of life. Um, for me now, I think I experience it as, um, like a tenured, a tenured associate professor. So, you know, that position comes with privilege, but I think a big responsibility in that is using that privilege to create space for other people who might still be trying to meet those basic needs or um, who might not have that platform themselves. So, um, you know, again, like I said before, unfortunately, it is the case still, especially in this country, that um, 
we need to often hustle for a living. Um, and most of us, most of us don't actually, especially, especially people who don't have access to higher education or means of paying for higher education. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have the luxury of being able to think, even think about, well, how do I resist dominant discourses in my life today? It might just be, well, where am I going to, how am I going to buy the sandwich <laughs> that I need to eat? So, um, so yeah, I think that's a really, that's kind of a really unfortunate reality. Um, and I'm trying to think of some other things here. Um, and I think that's, I think that's the main one. Um, oh, another thing that I thought of, um, that came to mind with one of the content creators that I spoke to was that her YouTube career was also um, a means of supporting her parents, her family, um, who were immigrants from China. And, um, you know, so, so I think that uh, in some ways, um, you know, she needed to be able to make that extra income, you know, not just for herself, but, but for the survival of her family. And maybe you could even say, for her community. Um, and, and so I think, I think that's probably, I think that's probably, <laughs> uh, the most, the most basic way of answering that question. Let me see if I have anything else in my notes here that I, that I missed. Um, yeah, I think those are, I think those are the points that I, I gain, um, that I learned from, um, from speaking to my participants. Um, and the interesting thing was for them, it wasn't even about making a lot of money. It was about making enough money to survive. And it was about making enough money to help others. Um, and I, I think that's also a common theme with people who are the children of immigrants, um, especially. Um, so you know, so that really struck me. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that this is something that we might see now in a more, um, in a different climate, actually, because I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what it's like to be a YouTuber right now. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it is overly saturated where these content creators are going. Um, maybe to places like Instagram or TikTok, um, and maybe it looks different there. Um, you know, maybe people's uh, ways of using these platforms to survive and resist look different there. Oh, another thing that I think is very important to, met to, to note, um, we don't want to make the assumption that just because someone is from a marginalized community, that they want to engage in some kind of um, resistance against dominant discourses. Um, that might not be their primary goal and that's okay. <laughs> I think people had, I had a hard time with that when I, when I first spoke through my, uh, to my initial round of um, interviewees and I kind of struggled with that because I thought, well, uh, you know, how can that not be your primary motivator or your primary goal? Um, those are assumptions that we, that we bring with us as researchers and people who are invested in these ideologies and people in the community might not be, and that's okay. <laughs> so, um, so again, I think it's complicated, um, but meeting, you know, basic, meeting basic needs for survival in order to be able to put time and energy um, into things like resisting dominant discourses, um, I think is, is the most obvious connection there. Awesome, wonderful, and perfect timing because the lab dog has just shut up <laughs> and come back. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have one loud one and one quiet, clingy one. And the mm -hmm. loud one is extremely loud. Um, mm -hmm. Before I adopted her, I looked her up and uh, on Wikipedia, it says her breed are also called little black devils and they're independent oh. and chaotic and um, like a Pomeranian, but larger yeah. and black. Um, mm -hmm. I was like, this will be fine. I had Jack Russell's when I was a kid, but in fact, yeah. it's worse. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. It's hard for me to imagine a dog <laughs> uh, harder to rein in than a Jack Russell. <laughs> that's, that's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're all good dogs, but um, they're a lot. Plus their hearts. All right. Um, 
Okay, so I'm just going to skip. I'm just going to skip down a little bit. Um, so one of the things that um, you taught, you read about in this work was the um, the way that YouTube, you know, that kind of like right there, close shot in the camera, um, mm -hmm. bringing people into your home allows that strong identification between the author and the audience. Um, what are the risks or the downsides of that kind of intimacy? Or yeah. what might they be? Hmm. One of my participants talked about this actually, um, because one of her videos, the, the one that actually went viral and, um, you know, gave her this big platform. Um, she, I think she ended up with, at the time of the writing of my dissertation, I think it was several hundred thousand subscribers, but mm -hmm. by, at this point, um, this is kind of going off topic. Um, I've kind of followed her through the last, through the last seven years as far as where she's gone with her life. It's, it's, she's, she's actually been able to develop her own skincare brand off of the um, money that she made from her channel. And um, she was, she's at like several million at least, but anyway, um, she, her, one of her videos, the one that went viral was about um, using um, like a steamer that you would use for clothes mm -hmm. to open up pores in your face and extract acne or blackheads. And so she would do a lot of, um, videos of her, um, her skin, um, when she had a lot of acne, um, and do kind of like close-ups of her face in a way that she felt was very vulnerable, um, in order to normalize acne, but also to document, um, you know, her, uh, the process of her skin, um, healing and also how she was treating the acne. And, um, you know, she did say that she received a lot of hate from, you know, creating videos where people would make fun of her skin or criticize the way that she looked. Um, but according to her, it was still worth it <laughs> because of the community that she developed outside of, um, outside of the haters, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. Um, and I think, I think that generally, um, you know, that's always going to be a risk anytime you put yourself out there, but it's especially risky, I think, for people who come from certain communities and it's important to know, um, it's important to know what those risks are. And I, I don't think I fully understand them even myself. Um, I haven't put myself out there quite in the way that she did. Um, and that she does. Um, but if you look at, uh, if you watch some of the videos that she, uh, that she has posted at this point years ago uh, um, discussing this exact issue, um, she was able to actually create a very strong community herself um, of people who struggled with skin problems of, you know, specifically um, women who struggled with appearance and skin issues and, um, you know, that was something that she described as being like a, the big motivating factor behind what she was doing um, and, and very worthwhile as far as the um, relationships that she made with other people. Yeah. Something else that I thought of that I think was, um, I, I was looking at this question when you emailed it to me, um, cancel culture. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I can say I've experienced personally either, but I think about it a lot um, when I see it happening. Uh, and I think about the idea of calling out versus calling in mm -hmm. and what that can look like in those spaces. Yeah. So, you know, I think cancel culture is probably even a, a bigger thing now than it, than it was like 10 years ago, but right. um, and I'm, I'm not really active in the YouTube beauty community anymore. Like I'll occasionally watch a video, but I, I don't really follow it anymore, but I see it happening in other online community spaces. And I think it's interesting to look at the ways in which um, users call each other in, in those spaces um, or attempt to call in instead of call out. Um, and, um, you know, in some situations, I think that um, that can be a more productive way of engaging with people, um, especially when there's a behavior that you want to point out or a behavior that you want to change. And so that's that's really interesting to me. Um, I, was, 
say, I think cancel culture is kind of a tricky one to talk about mm. in these yeah. contexts because yeah. we only really call it that when we're talking about powerful, uh, dominant narratives, right? Um, at which point that question of like calling out versus calling in becomes yes. very difficult, right? Yeah. You know, if yeah. you're trying to call in, you know, 10 million subscribers. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I kind of, like maybe it looks a little bit more like, you know, that, that it's moving on, it's, um, or that it looks more like that kind of backlash to power. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> power that's, you know, perceived to have recruited the wrong people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the beauty community is actually an interesting place to look for these things because what you will also see um, which, you know, even though I don't follow it, I still see these things popping up, are content creators who have become very big and very famous mm -hmm. and maybe end up partnering with makeup brands or skincare brands. Um, and these, you know, um, these might be people of color, these might be people from marginalized communities, but they become very famous. Um, and then they might say something controversial and then they will experience cancel culture themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's the whole phenomenon of the apology video, the genre of the apology mm -hmm. video, um, and that's something that I haven't really gotten into, um, and I think takes it to another level. You know, I only kind of looked at content creators who were at the stage in their career where they they were maybe on the verge of, you know, becoming viral or becoming you know big time content creator, but weren't quite there yet. So, so it's interesting to me you know, what happens when, when that shift takes place. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I don't know myself, you know, I haven't, I haven't followed up with another study of what, of what that looks like when these, when these content creators get really big. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of their names off the top of my head right now, but um, I really, I really can't. My like short term memory is gone these days. Um, but yeah. there are some um, um, makeup, makeup tutorial like content creators who, uh, oh gosh, what was his name? James something. Oh, James, I can see his face. Yeah. <laughs> I know who you mean. I know who you mean. Everyone is going to know who you mean, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'll find yeah. it afterwards and give them, give, give the like. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Um, Charles. I kept wanting to say Cameron, but that's Titanic. James yeah. Charles. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, and then there was another one. Um, oh, gosh, what is her name? Um, oh, God, it's not coming to me right now. Um, but this this was an interesting. <laughs> this one was was interesting. It, it popped up in my like news my um my uh, like CNN news feed. Mm -hmm. Um, and it. it uh, she's a content creator on YouTube. Um, I think she's like a makeup or a beauty content creator. Um, and, uh, she identifies as trans. Um, and she made a really controversial statement recently about, um, uh, pitting trans women and cis women against each other. Um, specifically in making a, a, making a comment about, um, you know, trans woman I'm not going to quote her because I can't remember the article the the exact quote but she basically the critique was that she pitted them against each other and you know criticizing cis, the appearance of cis women and um comparing them with with trans women and um the backlash of that um were, was people saying, you know, th that's, that kind of goes, like, that's counterproductive to the goal that we want. What we want is for trans women and cis women to work together, um, you know, to work against, um, to work together against, um, you know, um, uh, the sexism and oppression um, that, that we experience. And, um, you know, that's really, uh, that's really the way that we are going to move past, you know, what, what we would call like turf thinking, um, uh, trans exclusionary, uh, radical, radical feminism. feminism. Yeah. yeah. So, so what we really want, um, really is to be able to work together. Um, uh, 
there were some actors from the show Pose or actresses and actors from the show Pose who spoke out on that and, and critiqued her, um, her statement. And so this was big enough to get into the news. And I thought that was really interesting as well. I don't know if you call that cancel culture, but it was very high profile. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know how she responded to that, um, but I thought it was really interesting. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know if there was like any, if there were any instances of calling in, um, but mm -hmm. there, there was definitely a calling out. Um, and, um, you know, was that, was that a risk or a downside of, you know, the online intimacy um, that this person choose, chose to create and, you know, being open with her identity as a trans person on YouTube? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if she would consider it a downside. Um, yeah. I think it's a really interesting conversation that comes out of that situation. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, I think, I think it's always, it's always a risky thing to do, especially for, for certain people. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, so we've been talking a bit about uh, the YouTube beauty community as a community of practice, community of expertise. Are there other spaces um, where you see those kinds of communities emerging or where you think they've been emerging? You kind of touched on like Instagram and TikTok as related platforms. Yeah. Um, well, so you said you were going to look at all that um, Avery and I wrote together for SIGDOC, I think, the um, technical, oh. tactical, technical communication. And we're reading, in a couple of weeks, we're reading um, Avery's new piece that co-authored mm -hmm. one about um, Black folk um, yeah. communities. Yeah, so not the big one from last year, the new one. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, we wrote a piece together um, a, ex that was a, pretty much exactly about um, communities of practice um, and his, his, um, study was about, um, trans, trans self-medding documentation, mm -hmm. um, in online forums. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think that might be one to look at for people who are interested in that, um, uh, because it was, it was very similar in terms of being, um, a study looking at, um, how marginalized communities were, um, well, creating, creating spaces for themselves, um, in places where, um, you know, they needed to, because this, you know, the official or sanctioned spaces for them, uh, you know, they were, they were being, uh, they were not being let into the official or sanctioned spaces for them. So for, in, in this case, um, you know, the trans community maybe didn't have access to, um, healthcare or were being barred from information or being discriminated mm -hmm. against by doctors and health healthcare, inst healthcare institutions. So then they would go to these message boards um, and, and create this, like these DIY tutorials and guides for other people in the community um, in terms of like what to ask a healthcare provider, how to get the hormones, um, how to administer, administer them to yourself and all of that information. Um, other spaces. So yeah, I'm really interested actually in how this is developing in spaces like uh, I don't I don't use TikTok. I don't really know anything about it because I'm old. <laughs> um, but Instagram is one that's really interesting to me, um, especially now given um, you know the political climate here in the United States. Um, one of the things that I've seen emerging that I think is really interesting is um, the um, uh, mutual aid and care, mm -hmm. um, communities of mutual aid and care that are being, um, I guess, uh, created and also, you know, um, shared on platforms like Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, there is uh, an organization here, well, an organization, it's actually a person um, who built uh, an organization called QTMA, um, Queer Trans Mutual Aid, in, in the state of Rhode Island or the city that I live in. However, it is now um, uh, basically a community on Instagram where people um, anonymously contribute or donate um, or, you know, businesses might be able to um, um, have events or pop-ups where they donate money um, for the purposes of providing mutual aid to trans folks who, who need help, who need financial assistance. Um, and I think there's a really important and interesting dynamic going on there. Um, 
the idea of mutual aid itself is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, just in terms of how it is formed out of a resistance to um, to this like late stage capitalism um, implosion that we're in, especially in the U.S., um, and how communities are growing in spaces like this um, in, to take care of each other, um, mm -hmm. where caring for other folks is really the central focus of the community. Um, and so that that is something that I think maybe is more relevant now um, and that I would be interested in learning more about, um, particularly in these these online communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and how are how are people uh, learning to take care of each other and others in ways that um, and how are we showing up for each other in ways that our you know officially sanctioned institutions institutions do not or cannot. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm working on a piece right now with a colleague who's um, also a rhetorician, also uh, from, the, from the US and is working in our public health program uh, at my university. And it's about those community health, community led health interventions and aid networks um, during uh, lockdowns and getting health information from the community. Mm -hmm. And the community having to step in and provide that culturally appropriate tactical um technical communication in order to get messages across in these communities where institutions have failed the communities yes. have to step in because the institution uh has not done what it's normally meant to do yeah absolutely um that actually makes me think of something i wrote down for another one of your questions um it's kind of a shift, a shift mm -hmm. in in the the work that I've been doing. But but, um, but what you what you just talked about made me think about the idea of the community fridge. I don't know if you have. Do you have community fridges there? Not really. We don't like we have a few. Yeah, we don't have that really low. Yeah, that low level food aid thing. Mm -hmm. We have um, yeah larger larger food pantries, and we've seen an increasingly high profile of those. Um, over the last 18 months as everyone has just lost their jobs. Um, and then at that kind of really little community level, I think the closest thing we would have would be like the, the neighbourhood libraries would be that same kind of granular. Right. Just to give folks an analogy to, to hang the community fridge on. I know what you're talking about. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so in my life outside of academia, um, I volunteer on a, a small um, CSA farm mm -hmm. and um, the CSA uh, one of the things that they do is they donate food to a, a small community fridge in the neighborhood but like as you mentioned in the last you know two years these fridges have been popping up in different neighborhoods in a, as in response to the COVID food crisis um, basically um, and people not being able to access food um, but also our infrastructure's inability to feed people during the pandemic when um, you know there was a you know failure of our um, uh, the systems that are supposed to make you know, grocery stores, <laughs> supply chain, all of those things were failing. Um, yeah. And so it really became up to the community to figure out how we could feed each other. And so um, people stepped in and set up these refrigerators that were, you know, th this one is literally on a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when people have food, they will put it in the refrigerator. And then the information about what's in the refrigerator will be circulated on Instagram. Um, so someone will say, Hey, just stock the fridge with, you know, um, a bunch of bread, milk, and yogurt. And so that will be put up on the, the community fridge Instagram. Um, and people who need food will go and get it. And other people will say, Hey, it looks like the fridge is empty today. And, um, we'll go and put, replenish it with, with more food, with food. So, um, so I think that's a really in interesting, um, you know, emergence of communities of mutual aid that are forming, um, and, you know, engaging in communication with other people in the community um, when, when, as you said, our, institu our institutions are failing um, um, so that we can take care of each other. Uh, and, um, you know, that actually, that actually requires, I think, a lot of attention to um, the needs of the audience and how to communicate with an audience effectively and how to, how to communicate information about where the food is and how to access it and think about who may or may not have access to, you know, the online information. Mm -hmm. 
I think I think there is an emergence of this kind of, um, you know, I guess you could say community of practice or mutual aid communities that are that are popping up now in the spaces uh, where, um, you know, there's a gap. Um, there's a gap in um, the way our social systems um, are supposed to be are supposed to be taking care of mm-hmm. taking care of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And with it, that kind of maybe a little bit of a shift from being that individual. Yes. Yeah, individual effects of social media to what are the potential collective effects. Oh, that's such a good point. Yeah, because so mm. much of what we say about social media and even my dissertation was about, you know, um, the individual content creator. Mm-hmm. But this is more like in the home, creator. right? And the individual yeah. viewer, right? Individual, yes. But but what you're talking about is a collective creation of content. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that addresses, and- ad- addresses a collective as well, right? It creates the community as something that is coherent and visible and interconnected um Mm -hmm. in very like online communities are real communities but uh in kind of very concrete and local ways Mm -hmm. yes and I think I think another thing that they accomplish is to take some of the stigma away from needing food um yeah I was thinking about like dignity when you were talking about the needs of the audience right like it's yeah having that affordance is huge. Mm-hmm. It's about respect, yeah. respecting the audience and understanding that the needs are multifaceted. Respecting and like even empowering. Um, you know, we talked about like having the, the means of survival empowering us to be able to do other things. Um, and so thinking about, you know, being in a position of having a surplus of food and being able to, you know, um, provide other uh, others in the community with with access to those needs, you know, um, can be empowering, I think, for the community as a whole. Um, and another thing that I've seen that is interesting uh, in the circles, or, uh, the, commu- the online communities around the community fridge is that you will see um, police sometimes in these neighborhoods go. And th- this one was interesting. There's one in Boston. The police will either go and shut it down, or in this case, the police took it as a photo opportunity. And they came, they, they went to this community fridge and they decided they wanted to take a picture of themselves in front of the fridge saying, hey, look at this great community fridge. Although they had absolutely nothing to do with the fridge at all. They'd never donated food. They'd never circulated any information about it. It just became a photo op for them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, in terms of co-opting, um, the, the co-opting the tactics of marginalized communities, I think you see that kind of happening as well. Mm-hmm. And also um, the social, the, the response to the community um, on social media being, being very interesting um, in terms of, you know, why the hell are the police using this as a photo op? Well, we know why they're using this as a photo op. Or, you know, stay away from this, you know, we're moving the fridge to this new location because the police tried to shut us down and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my last question is a little bit of an instrumental one, and I don't want it to come across as uh, co-opting the tactics of, um, of, yeah, uh, co-opting anything, really. so you talk about technical communication in the vernacular um, with this, the idea of tactical technical communication. Um, and these are all like versions of professional writing that are done outside of professional spaces. What do you think um, are the key takeaways from those kinds of technical and professional communication for writers working in more traditional uh, venues and workplaces? Yeah, um, so that's a really great question. And I would say, um, in those in those workplaces, you are still um, you are still um, working with an audience, and so I think remembering that it is really ultimately about the audience is key, um, and also thinking about what your relationship to the audience is and how you might nurture it or develop it or you know um, practice reciprocity and responsibility. I think those are all things that can translate. Um, to other professions, other other fields. Um, and so one of the questions that I, I wrote down, because I think it's important, is, you know, when you're working with an audience, you can ask yourself, well, what privileges do I bring with me? Um, you know, what frameworks am I operating within 
um, and who do they benefit and who do they leave out and why? And also I think another important one is like, who, who am I speaking for? And being very careful um, and attuned to that one, I think, especially. Um, so, you know, those might be questions that people may ask themselves when they are, um, you know, thinking about audience in a professional context. Um, but I think those are also questions that are important when you think about any audience in any context, um, when you're doing any kind of communicating with people. Um, and the key there being fostering or nurturing a relationship with that audience that is reciprocal. Um, because that's something that I think, um, you know, we are not really taught to do very often um, and can result in, you know, co-opting or can result in, um, uh, you know, further marginalization of certain communities. Um, it can result in being completely unaware of, of um, power differences and dynamics. Um, so, so I think, yeah, asking yourself, um, you know, who are you speaking for and why, um, you know, what privileges do you bring with you? Do you bring with you in this situation? Um, I think, I think those are really important regardless of the, the context. Yeah, it's really that ethical, that ethical orientation that, yeah, really, like it's at the heart of technical and professional communication of rhetoric is thinking of writing as between people and, and always an ethical act. And it's something, yeah, we read, um, you, you, you may have read already, Josie and Jimmy's rhetorical hedonism, grey genres piece oh, in CDQ okay. uh, a few that. weeks ago and they joined us. And um, it's, I love it. Um, I think you'll enjoy it as well. Um, they talk about um, the fact that, technical communication always has that reputation of being like checkbox, like instrumental, right? Um, we know that techcom kind of came a little bit late to the party on thinking about ethics, but has, you know, really made that move and is placing the heart of scholarship now. Um, and in their article, they're, they're actually talking about like, actually having fun technical communication is good and it's always mm -hmm. been there, right? Um, and if you do something that's fun, it's going to circulate and be delivered. But um, I'm in hearing you talk about that ethical orientation of actually thinking about the audience and making deliberate choices. I was thinking about um, it very closely aligns with what they say about, um, yeah, the way that we often think about this communication in workplaces as instrumental, as here is your report genre tick off the boxes and yeah I think we benefit so much from thinking thinking beyond that thinking of communication as between people and in a community and serving serving communities yeah I'm actually you had you just made a thought pop into my head um so one of the one of the things that I'm interested in looking at now is when you what happens when you take that reciprocity and ethical communication and expand it to think about you know non-human relationalities or, you know, environmental, or, you know, I'm particularly interested in plants and agricultural relationalities, <laughs> our relationships with natural resources. Um, how do we, how do we do ethical communication in that regard and thinking about, um, you know, how we are caring for these different parts of our environment and that we're all interconnected and need each other for survival. Um, and I think that's a question that one can ask, um, you know, when it comes to working with uh, communication in any of those contexts. Um, so, um, yeah, you've given me a lot to think about. I really appreciate that. I have, I have some notes here, is that particularly about, what you talked about the individual in the home versus the collective. I was like, oh, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> I know, I've got a whole bunch of stuff ticking away in the back of my head for, for my, yeah, my next thing as well. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So you said you're, um, yeah, thinking about environmental and non-human communication. Is that what you're working on uh, at the moment? Is that what's next for you? I'm trying to. Um, I, I kind of thought this like associate professor thing was going to mean that I would have more time and space for my own work. Um, no, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. So, but yeah, that's um, that is what I want to be next. I'm kind of trying to shift in that direction. Um, I, I am actually working with um, 
one of my very best friends who is who also um, happens to have worked at um, Farm Fresh Rhode Island and um, the AmeriCorps um, Vista um, here. And what she did was um, pretty much single-handedly uh, developed a mobile platform to connect farmers to people who are in need of food during COVID because with the whole failure of the supply chain, the grocery store shelves being empty, people weren't getting food, but because restaurants were closed, farms had too much food. Yeah. There was just no one to get the food. There was no one to you know connect these things. And so she created this um, mobile platform where people could actually connect and order food directly from the farm. And then the, the there was a kind of like an inter the farm fresh Rhode Island um, was the in, um, basically the go between who would deliver the food from the farm to the people mm-hmm. and that that's really um, kind of revolutionary in the sense of like bypassing the supply chain the mm-hmm. food supply chain and creating one in a way when you think about mutual aid in a community that cares for each other um, creating a relationship between people and you know the farms that, that grow the food um, mm-hmm. and it scales so, in a way that community supported agriculture can't yes. mm, cool um, and and uh, the other thing that she did was um, make this platform accessible to recipients of food stamps, which I think mm-hmm. is very important because often these small organic chemical free farms can be expensive. And most of the time, you know, if you have food stamps, you can't spend all of your money on, you know, like three or four vegetables that were organically grown. Mm-hmm. Um, but having farms, um, you know, think about how to make their produce accessible to people um, and, and able to use food stamps to access that produce was really important. It was another important thing that she did, um, which is a lot of labor on her part for someone who is doing this essentially um, almost for free. Um, but she's, so I think she's a really important um, member of the community that I am trying to um use whatever little bit of platform I have to create a space um, so that we can learn from her. Um, so she's going to be at C's uh, talking about the farm and her oh, work. Cool. Um, but I'm thinking about this in terms of, you know, community-based knowledge production. And uh, on the panel, we're talking about um, how institutional sanctions keep community partners out of our sites of knowledge making because of all the gatekeeping, ivory tower gatekeeping that happens. Um, and then thinking about how to, um, you know, learn from these community partners um, and um, understand that, um, you know, the gatekeeping of knowledge production, um, you know, ha- not just to bypass, but to actually break down the gatekeeping of knowledge production um, and to, um, you know, let these community partners take the lead so that we can learn from what they're doing. Um, and, and, you know, for her, from that standpoint, is this is more of a food, and, you know, a food and food policy, um, you know, uh, I guess you could say food and food policy practice where she uh, bypassed, bypassed an entire broken system to make food accessible. Um, and so we're talking about disrupt, disrupting sanction modes of knowledge making, um, and also, you know, specifically to, the, you know, in the COVID food crisis, um, the kinds of communication that happened around around that around that crisis, um, and how people were able to, um, you know, get information about where they could get food and how to get food, and also specifically how to get food from these farms. Um, and so that's something that I, I'm really interested in, partly because um, it feels a little bit more um, concrete at this moment in time. I don't really do need to make up tutorials anymore. Um, it feels a little bit more um, uh, in line with kind of where I want my, my where my values are now mm-hmm. in that I don't just want to be an academic. I want to be able to... Um, serve the community in in many different ways, um, but also maybe allow the community to show us how to break down some of those gatekeeping structures. Um, so, so I think that's where I'm going next, um, mm-hmm. where I wanna go. And there's still, there still some, you know, uh, strands there of, mm-hmm. of you know, um, looking more broadly at uh, marginalized communities and, um, um, the ways in which they, you know, may do 
smaller or tactical things um, in ways that either bypass or break down, um, you know, sanctioned institutions or, you know, operate within them in ways that are still resisting oppressive, oppressive systems that are keeping people from, um, you know, having access to what they need to survive. Yeah. yeah. And building more sustainable, just yes. options. Yes. I love it. Awesome. <laughs> That's so exciting. I don't know if I'm going to make it to seas because our borders might be open, but I feel like the university might not be going to let us travel. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that would be appointment viewing for me. I would love to see that. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Well, I don't know. We don't know. Who knows? It's supposed to be in yeah, Chicago. Who knows? who knows what's going to happen? Could be like the last one. Yeah. Get help. You know, yeah. maybe it'll be online again. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I am, yeah, I've learned so much from talking to you and I'm so excited to, yeah, pull some of the threads out um, for my own, for my own work and for uh, the students this week. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's it. I really because <laughs> I feel like I got a lot of ideas. I wrote them all down. I was like, "Hey, here's another thing that I haven't thought about yet," or like, "Here's a connection that I haven't thought about yet." So, um, you know, anytime I can have the opportunity to like talk and be energized by the conversation, I'm really, really thankful for it because it's hard to come by that energy these days. Right. Yeah. <laughs> With everything else that we have to do and everything that's happening in the world. So. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I, I appreciate that a lot also. And, and thank your students for those awesome questions. Yeah. All right. So can you start by introducing, wait, no, I have to do my polite thank you. I forgot. Um, yeah. So 